Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. It's been a long time since I've recorded a video. I was ill for a while. We're remodeling a room in our house so the whole library's fill up with, you know, furniture and materials and we're getting a room ready for my daughter for her, for her birthday. But uh, I saw something from Brian at Bookish last week and I thought I gotta jump in the fray. So I, I threw these nice curtains up and we're gonna provide 25 more contenders for the great American novel. American here referring to books uh, that are written in the US. Uh, there are great American novels from South America, Central America, the Caribbean, even Canada has some amazing contenders. But following in the steps of Greg over at Supposedly Fun and Brian at Bookish, whose videos I'll throw in the description box below, these are gonna be books written by someone in the US, uh, about the US, set primarily in the US. And, and through these, I wanna sort of explore some themes. That, that were jumping out to me as I was kind of making my own list. So none of these books were on Brian's list. And uh, you know, I'd read at least 20 of the ones on his and enjoyed many of them. But th these are some more that I think are important. So one of the themes that I thought was really important was the explicit idea of redemption. A, a lot of times it's Christian redemption uh, or, or it's uh, a sort of a cousin to Christian redemption. But it's a theme that runs through U.S. literature uh, very explicitly. And it's, it's a theme of, uh, that has been explored from, from the nature of like positive redemption, but also this idea that, uh, that, that people can fe think that they've somehow you know, whitewashed something uh, and, and to ex examine has that really occurred. So the first book that came to mind to me was The Scarlet Letter by uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, published originally in, uh, I believe it was 1850. And uh, a book that, if you've never read it, I would recommend actually just skip the whole custom house section. It tries to draw this setting, uh, but once we get into the actual meat of the narrative, there, there's just a dynamic uh, nature to the characterizations between uh, Hester Prynne, her daughter Pearl, Reverend Dimsdale, uh, Roger Chillingworth, Th these, these characters who feel uh, deeply, deeply, deeply focused on this idea of redemption. Is it possible? Is redemption impossible and therefore life is, is almost hopeless and pointless? Uh, and what does that lead characters to do? What, what is that sensibility? How does it inform one's life, one's desires, one's goals? And I think it's most eloquently expressed in the 19th century in The Scarlet Letter. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating book. Whether or not Hawthorne believes in everything that he's writing about in terms of, of like the idea that someone could be condemned to a perpetual hell, there are, there's no doubt that his characters believe that, that he has characters who believe that and operate that way. And I, I think that's something that is important to examine, is important to explore. Another book uh, that deals with redemption and, and from a, a different, very different sensibility is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and I think what, what I think of with redemption in this book is not so much the question of uh, is redemption possible, but sometimes whether it's even necessary. Because what's so beautiful about Their Eyes Were Watching God is the sense that everyone wants something for Janie. Everybody thinks Janie some, somehow needs to make good, that you know she, she's experiencing failures in her life and in her relationships. And I think what Hurston is questioning is, is, is that true? Uh, does Janie need these things that, that everyone is sort of pushing upon her? Uh, is, is it that she somehow needs to, to redeem the decisions she's made? Or is she reaping what she's sown with the decisions she's made? Or is this rather just life that's happening and Janie is a human being? Uh, and, and I think there's something that's really fascinating about this. The, the dialects that, uh, that Hurston presents in this book um, just are incredible. But there's a, there's a real uh, tension between Hurston's prose that is incredibly fluid and deeply modernist, and then the very authentic, realistic dialect of the characters in their dialogues. This is a great book. Uh, up next, and these are just in chronological order, not in order of a ranking, would be East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Again, a book that is obsessed with, with explicit uh, Christian and Judeo-Christian ideas around redemption, like incredibly explicitly. So many people will quote Tim Shell from this book. Uh, and yet, it's also a book that's exploring life in the Salinas and, and the valley, the, the farm valleys there. Uh, what does it mean to, to profit off of a war? And, and the violence that exists in it. What does it mean uh, to, to make choices and, and to maintain those choices? Who is it that is able to forgive? Uh, these are all questions that occur. We have the, the two different families who are, um, and, and the focus is the Trask family, and yet in some ways it's their neighbors who provide so many of the beautiful moments and, and the characterizations. Probably the most heartbreaking death in the book is not any of the Trasks or any of their relatives. 
it's a it's a son who in a sense has failed his sister on some level and can't see any way forward um, and so there, there's something that is is poetic and beautiful uh, about so many of the, the chapters in this book um, and it, it's one of sort of the great American novels that I first encountered 20 plus years ago and then finally another book that sort of is is in communion with her Hurston's question around you know, uh, is is this concept of redemption necessary? It would be Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. Uh, probably one of my picks for the great American novel if we were getting down to a, like a final four. And a book that in so many ways, uh, I think exemplifies the best of Morrison. Her writing, her the, the, the sensuous nature of her writing, that it is tactile, we taste, we hear, uh, we feel what her characters are experiencing. Uh, and yet the, this is also the novel that I think most closely examines so many um, of these ideas. Beloved, of course, does as well. But here Morrison is, is grounding it more in the 20th century uh, in, in a place that I think she was always a little more comfortable writing. And I, I think it just barely manages to edge Beloved in, in my reading. So moving in a different direction, there are... Along with this idea of the religious sensibilities and the, these questions around redemption, the, the, the fact that um, the, the U.S. in many ways is a nation apart in, in some way from, from the sensibilities of Europe or even from uh, Central and South America from a religious perspective, I think uh, is unique and is, is exemplified in its literature. But there's also something unique about the U.S. in terms of the idea of conspiracy. Uh, the libertarian ideal, the, this individualist sensibility, uh, an idea that there are a privileged few who have captured something real and that the, everybody else is kind of operating on some established norms that aren't really true uh, and that, that you, you can be subversive, you can break out of that and, and to be a true American great, an American individual, one is, is going to strip through that and become someone new, find oneself on the new frontier. Well, one of the books that does that is Moby Dick or The Whale by Herman Melville. Uh, this is a book that you could write an encyclopedia of whale. <laughs> uh, what is it, cetology or something? Uh, about whales from this. And yet the questing nature of Ahab, the horrifying in, in its magnificence, uh, but truly horrifying. And that juxtaposed with Ishmael, who is along for the ride and yet uh, possesses levels of agency that, that are sometimes just seem to be overworn and overwhelmed by Ahab in his mad quest for the white whale. Uh, this is a book that, that uh, reveals that this questioning nature of the establishment. Is, is Ahab a hero to you know, demand this obsession? Uh, does that make him somehow a greater captain or, or is he a madman, a villain? Uh, those are questions that you know, the book perhaps never quite answers. And yet the, the sense of depth, not just to the ocean, but to each of the characters, to the relationships among the characters in the book, I think make it worthwhile. It's a great book. Up next, I have a book that's funny at times, not so much set in the U.S., but a book that I think informs that sense of uh, the, the, the man behind the curtain, the truth, you know, uh, behind what we're actually seeing here is Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, uh, published in 1973, a book that is overwhelming, again, in its detail, encyclopedic in its references and jokes, and a book that is challenging one's sensibilities, um, trying to make jokes of some of the true horrors of the 20th century and what was happening in the 1940s worldwide. Uh, the, the sense that the world could be ending. It, it's, it's an apocalyptic novel uh, that perhaps never actually includes an apocalypse. And yet, yet it has that sensibility, uh, this sense that Pynchon has, has found something. And there are readers of this book, I think, who, who engage in this idea, who engage in this idea that it, by finishing Gravity's Rainbow, one is able to somehow uh, uh, probe deeper into the truth, into the consciousness, uh, the, the references to pop culture that abound. I think those are uh, sensibilities within U.S. literature. Up next, another uh, author Brian had mentioned, Don DeLillo, uh, and to me, Libra. Libra is a book that examines this uh, convergence of conspiracies around plans to assassinate John F. Kennedy. Uh, in one narrative, we have Lee Harvey Oswald, we see his life, the way that he is colliding with history, inserting himself into history, uh, even though he seems to be a nobody. Uh, and, and this very American idea, this sense of individual, that an individual can be important, an individual can insert himself or herself into history and, and do some great act or great tragedy uh, and be remembered. 
Um, and, but we also have the, the conspiratorial nature of this, where Delulo is questioning, he, we, in another narrative, we have characters who are planning a fake assassination attempt that will fail, but prod political pressure on the US. Uh, and then in a third narrative, we have someone examining all of these redacted memos, all of these plans that, that we, and the general public, would not be privy to, but there's somehow this secret that Delilo's uh, narrator and that narrative has been able to access. And it, it, is, a, it is an incredibly fluidly written book, uh, and yet it, it examines this idea around who do we believe, who do we trust. And then finally, uh, my volume of short stories for the great American novel, uh, Jesus' Son by Dennis Johnson, uh, one of the finest um, and most unsparing books, I think, written. A book that uh, is set with characters who are on the very fringe of society, who have completely uh, disavowed any establishment, any uh, normal society, a monetary-based society uh, with, with a job and a family. All of those have been eschewed by characters here for various reasons. And Johnson allows us to see their humanity, but also allows us to see uh, the danger when one is no longer uh, within the protection of society. One is tr has, has placed oneself outside the law as this outlaw, uh, and yet is, is, is still living a life. And what does that look like? Uh, and so this is a masterpiece if you've never read it. Now with those, I want to shift to some books that examine the idea of legacy. Uh, and, and, and this idea of legacy from the perspective that anybody can become wealthy, anybody can become successful. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter who your parents were. There's, there's, certainly there's generational wealth, there's income inequality. We know this is true. And yet there's this, this myth within the US that anyone can rise up, anyone can become a hero or a heroine, anyone can become a senator or the president. Uh, whether or not these things are true, we, 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 we want to believe that they're true, that we believe that in a more equal society, this would be true. But that lends itself to this question of legacy. Uh, if one cannot inherit, one cannot bequeath titles, what can one bequeath? What, what does legacy and, and the sense of carrying on look like in a family uh, where some of those ideas from the old world are no longer present? And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the copy I'll show here is from my daughter's Illustrated Classics edition. But Louisa May Alcott, I think, sets some, some questions around that with Little Women, uh, published after the Civil War, a book that, that primarily focuses on, on women and on sisters. And yet we see these archetypal ideas around them. We have a, a sister who's intelligent. We have a sister who wants to, to be part of the traditional norm and, and have a family. We have a sister who is has this more artistic sensibility and is impulsive in some way. And yet is also willing, what is she willing to compromise? Uh, and, and I think that's what the message of Little Women is this idea of identity and compromise and what can one take? Well, how, you know, we, th this idea within the U.S. that we, we play the hand we're dealt. And I think the March sisters, to a certain extent, play the hands they're dealt uh, flawlessly, to a certain extent. They play different hands, they win different rounds of the game, and yet each of them is playing this hand almost flawlessly. And it's really incredible to see how Lou Alcott was able to examine these ideas from her perspective and, and to inject this, these questions uh, and these choices and these agents, this agency into characters in the 1860s. It's just marvelous. And it, it really is a book uh, for, for people who think like, oh, it's sentimental or it's romance. No, it, the characterizations are very thorough. They're very rewarding. Um, and my daughter read this when she was seven and, and we had these really wonderful discussions around it. And I'm excited to read the full book with her in a couple of years when, when she's ready for that. Uh, and then we'll see if we make it to Little Men. But Little Women is a contender for the great American novel. Up next, uh, Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner, a, a book that asks, you know, that this idea of legacy is Sutpen is desperately trying to find a son and, and have a son that he can, he can give everything to. Even when we see that he's, the, the, in the aftermath of the Civil War, he's lost his plantation. He is no longer able to own human beings that get labeled slaves. He's no longer able to do that. And yet he desperately wants this this son, this heir to his legacy and what that means for Sutpen and, and the, the identities of who his sons actually are and the choices they make are fascinating. The way that Faulkner a, a allows us to peer into this world and peer into these, again, obsessive quests uh, for legacy, it's very comparable, I think, to Ahab. And yet to, to 
allow Sutpin moments of humanity, moments where he does seem like the great man, uh, even as we reveal that not only he has clay feet, but it's clay thighs and a clay bottom. Um, then a book that, a couple of these are books that I read when I was in my early 20s, and I thought, ah. but as I've aged in the intervening 12, 15 years, as I've aged, I've begun to appreciate what the authors were examining. Uh, and that would be American Pastoral by Philip Roth. When I first read this book, I thought it was pretty mediocre. I preferred The Ghost Rider. I thought that was really like wild and outrageous uh, without being ridiculous like Portnoy's Complaint. Um, but American Pastoral, as I've aged, I begin to see this idea of uh, the, the relationships that are at the core of it are not um, necessarily the relationships I was examining when I was in my 20s, but it's very much this relationship of a family of the Lvov family and, and, and what every, everything that's happening around them. I was looking at it and saying like, this guy doesn't get the civil rights movement. This guy, he's just, just totally missing him by. What was hap what, what I was missing was the, the depth of emotion between the father and daughter characters uh, in the Lvov family. And, and as I sort of have reread it and, and re-examined it, I think Roth really hit on something there. This, again, this idea of legacy that, uh, so many people want this their children to have a better life than they had and that's a universal idea i think that's a global literature idea but it feels uniquely american because of that that myth that anybody can become successful and so if someone has become successful they want their child to be even more successful and that this grasping nature uh towards legacy is something that i think roth really captured and it, it is also a book that the opening 10 pages and the final 10 pages of the book are just legitimately crystalline perfect. Uh, wh whether or not it's your contender for a great American novel, even if you never read the entire book, if you just sit down and read the first 10, 20 pages of American Pastoral, the, the ideas, the themes that Roth introduces right away are incredible. The way that he then develops those and develops the characterizations of a family in the 1960s in the U.S. and, and, and explores just the, the, the way that the violence abroad is gradually brought home and then brought truly home to a household in the family is is incredible finally uh another one that i would put up there with song of solomon is probably in my like mount rush you know my, my final four uh contenders shadow country by peter matheson this is a book that matheson in his old age went back and took three book novels he had written and revised nearly every sentence in them and reworked ideas reintroduced completely new characters uh, really went to examine what was happening um, with uh, with the, the U.S. Deep South, with Florida um, in the Jim Crow era and introduced a, a biracial character who's crucial to the narrative at the beginning and end. Um, and, and what emerged was this absolute masterpiece that's far superior to anything Peter Matheson wrote. And Matheson wrote probably three other great books, like legitimately great books, but this towers above all of them. Uh, this is a book that examines the, the legacy of E.J. Watson, a uh, sugarcane farmer who becomes incredibly successful, a sometime outlaw, a man of many parts, many families. Uh, and and it, Matheson explicitly examines in the opening through a series of narratives of witnesses to Watson's life and ultimate death. We know he dies and we know how he dies. Uh, but constantly Matheson's sort of cutting at this, this man. The middle uh, is really about his sons and his children and, and the way that they try to deal with the legacy of their father and his death. And then in the final section, we get Watson's own voice. Um, and and we, it, it reveals really the horror of obsessing over wealth and legacy and all of these things. And yet Watson's uh, refusal to, to stop, to quit. He, can t he, he essentially takes a boat back home at the end knowing what will happen because he, he can't help himself. This is who he has been his entire life. This is a masterpiece, I highly recommend it. Um, now, moving in a different, uh, sort of following in that direction though, uh, four books that focus on the, the unique aspect of greed. If anybody can become great, it's because the anybody can become wealthy. Uh, it doesn't matter who your parent was, it matters how large your bank account is in, in any sense. That's, that's the, the underbelly of that myth. Is the, is the avaricious, grasping nature of what's, what governs so many choices people in the U.S. are, are making and that our parents have made and our, and our ancestors have made. Um, and these are books that, that examine greed in, in real detail. One of them 
again chronologically first, McTeague, A Story of San Francisco by Frank Norris. Frank Norris was one of the most absolutely horrifying, virulent anti-Semites ever. Uh, and it came through in a number of his, his books, like in real detail. Doesn't happen much in McTeague. Uh, McTeague is a book that really examines characters encountering extra money and then watching it ruin their lives, like truly ruin their lives. Not just that they die, but that they are essentially like they undergo physical pain and torture to a certain extent uh, before they even die. That, that the, the money, the, the greed is just ripping them apart. It was filmed uh, in 1924 as greed explicitly by Eric Fred Strong. But the novel is, is, is this this brilliant masterwork from a man who was was often just just lashing out in his prose. Uh, here, the, the, we have a character who is a, McTeague himself is a, is a dentist, an unlicensed dentist, which is crucial. And he and his friend sort of seem to like the same girl. The friend gives her up, says, hey, McTeague, you can date her. And then it turns out she's won $5,000 in the lottery. And the way that each of the three of them, McTeague, his wife, Trina, who has won the 5,000, and Marcus, the friend, how all three of them are essentially torn apart by that by that five thousand uh, dollars, and the detail that that Norris imbues in this, um, ending with this climax in Death Valley, uh, the characters who have in a sense put themselves into hell, uh, explicitly in like the most explicit way possible, uh, and then the final sort of paragraph page of this book, how it ends, is astonishing. There, there's nothing quite like it. Um, I don't recommend any of Norris's other books, but this one is is a great American novel. Up next, the one book I couldn't find. So I was digging through the library and there's just some shelves I cannot access right now because of the furniture in front of them. But it's The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton, uh, 1905. Uh, the Gilded Age and sort of the after, the, the very end of the Gilded Age, a decade before Titanic um, and World War I and, and, and the, the end of that Gilded Age. Uh, but the, the, the progressive era is just starting, but it, it's not really going to, to come into full swing yet. And, and a book in which Wharton examines Lily Bart and, and the way that uh, she wants so much and, and has so much and, and to see what happens and transpires across her life. I know Brian had mentioned The Age of Innocence, but I think The House of Mirth really hits home uh, in a way that The Age of Innocence uh, is, is, I don't want to say afraid to, because Wharton wasn't afraid to write that book. She wrote it in House of Mirth. But there's some, there's a different sensibility. There's, I think, a, a truer sensibility in House of Mirth. Then a crime novel, The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Maybe the best crime novel, maybe not. Uh, but, but one in which we see how the, in, in, in other books, uh, we've seen the, this idea that uh, greed and wealth and this, this desire for legacy have led to, to crimes and murders and, and, and large scale uh, violence in, at times. Here we see it it's sort of in its squalor. Um, and there was something that Dashiell Hammett had seen, he had witnessed, he, he had seen violent strike breaks on that epic scale, but he'd also seen murders, casual murders for $100, $200, something that would, that would give by a person a couple of months, but not a lifetime of happiness and, and security. Uh, and, and the way he's able to capture that in The Maltese Falcon is just incredible. It introduces Sam Spade. Uh, and it's the, it is the Sam Spade novel. Hammett did not go and write a dozen more of these books with this detective and with these characters. He wrote one, and it's a great American novel. And then finally, probably the funniest book of, of all of these is J.R. by William Gaddis, a book that is told almost entirely through dialogue, uh, <laughs> a book that examines the, the false hope of greed, uh, but also the absolutely absurd nature that, that monetary systems exist because of social agreements and social contracts. And they're, they're just constructs that everybody agrees to. And then uh, some then are able to manipulate. And Gaddis explore, explores all of that and he explodes all of that. The, the way that at the very end of the book, there's someone yelling uh, about doing the job you're paid to do, having revealed the entire farce that is salaried work, hourly wage, a, a Federal Reserve, you know, <laughs> oil futures, any of these. Um, and and the, the rip-roaring humor at the heart of it uh, is just great. And this is, uh, this is a book I read a, a while back. I read it on buses while a track coach. We would take these long bus rides and I would be reading it and laughing really loudly. And the students would say, well, what is it? What is it? And I would say, uh, it's, 
if you ever really want to read a great book, read this book. <laughs> and it's been great to see how many people have been exposed to this with NYRB classics, you know, re-releasing it. This is, this is a real masterpiece. And the next theme is one that Brian, I think, was very explicit about. And it's the idea that there are two aspects to American identity, U.S. identity, that are crucial and, and that are unique in some respects. And I think unique in some respects, like actually unique. And one is the, the fact that human bondage slavery existed here until fairly recently, where my father-in-law can, can look and, and, and basically count not even, you know, he doesn't even need all the fingers on one hand to count back how many generations to his grandfather who was born as a slave and then freed. Um, and he didn't know that man, but he knew his, my father-in-law knew his own grandfather who had known that man. That, that was how close things were. Um, and so to, to reckon with that, as U.S. society continues to do and, and fails to do in so many ways, is crucial. But equally, the idea that that all of the wealth and the resources of U.S. were taken violently from the indigenous Americans, the Native Americans, the, the First Nations, uh, sits in parallel with each other. And, and there, there are books that examine that. And there are some of these books have examined that. But the, I think these, these books will, will examine it, I, I think, from that specific perspective. So one is Cain. Uh, Cain is by Gene Toomer. This is a modernist masterpiece. It was written in 1920. It was published in 1923, written in the years before that. It is a book that explores so many different aspects of uh, black identity, African-American identity in the southern United States, in the northern United States, in rural areas, in urban areas. Uh, there are vignettes, there are sketches, there are self-contained stories, there are poems that are almost songs. It's a masterpiece in every respect. And it has this sort of spiraling loop of cycles that Toomer wanted to explore. Um, cannot recommend it highly enough. Up next would be a writer who was willing to explore the legacy of slavery from a perspective that I think is quite crucial, and that is Octavia Butler in Kindred, where she has a character set in the middle of the 20th century, where she's it's in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, and, and she has levels of freedom and levels of agency. She's happily married, um, and she's educated, and yet she's ripped into the past into the experiences of her enslaved ancestors. And she sees how horrifying that was in crucial and brutal detail, uh, where, where Butler does not shy away from that. And we have a character who's trying to examine uh, both the, the 19th century and the 20th century from both of these perspectives that she's really experiencing. Uh, and I don't know of too many books that, that are able to do that. Beloved, I think, uh, examines the 19th century incredibly well and the legacy of slavery incredibly well. Um, Ryan had mentioned Edward P. Jones, The Known World. There are so many books that try to do that. I think Butler, through, through a vehicle of science fiction, was able to examine it um, in, a, in a way that never feels false, that never feels like a construct, even though it's science fiction. And this is a book I, again, highly recommend. Uh, and up next, Brian Stoll, Invisible Man. I didn't want any repeats, but I am going to include Juneteenth, or uh, Three Days Before the Shooting by Ralph Ellison. The second novel that he never quite finished, um, brought together by an editor, a literary executor into Juneteenth, a book that is a masterpiece, a book that needs to be read, a book in which Ellison was able to elevate some of the work he was doing in Invisible Man and, and, and create these incredibly beautiful moments for characters, a, a character who is raised uh, by a black minister and it's unclear whether he's white or black. He's able to move between both worlds. We see the moment when he realizes he can move between both worlds and how that boy Bliss becomes Adam Sunraider, a wildly racist senator from the North uh, who is then later assassinated. Um, and, and, and as he's lying there dying in a hospital bed, the minister who had raised him comes and they, they sit and they have this almost holy communion between each other where they're, they're remembering things and building on ideas from each other and exploring the, this legacy that, that continues to stain the US. Um, it's a book that, that I, I had never really read anything quite like it, and I, I, I just want more and more people to read Juneteenth. Um, and then finally, The Roundhouse by Louis Erdrich. Uh, this, I know Brian had selected The Night Watchman, which I was, I was surprised by. Um, I think The Roundhouse, it, it's, a, it's a more personal book on some level. It's less global, and I should say perhaps less national in its scope. And yet it is a book that, that um, 
allows Native American voices to rise and to, to, to be authentic. Um, and, and I think that Erdrich, she, she had some different ideas in the 21st century that she's gone with on some of her novels. Um, but this is the one where she seems to get it all right. Uh, that, that she seems to just, just nail down the details. And we have this very realistic sense, but also this sense of what is, what is her sensibility? What is the sensibility of someone who's Ojibwa? Um, and how is it different from someone who has, is perhaps living in a rural uh, existence or is living in a city in the U.S. Uh, and is, is Native American? Well, how do those sensibilities collide? What do they look like and feel like? And I think the Roundhouse is where she really allowed that to come forward. Finally, five books that uh, I think in some way, they're subversive in some way. So I have In a Lonely Place by uh, Dorothy B. Hughes. This is a, another crime novel. I wanted to include some genre works here because I think it's possible for, for genre works to be like the great American novel. Uh, here, Hughes is subverting ideas around patriarchy. Uh, the idea that, uh, or the idea that society and, and the law will protect a woman. Uh, we, we have a character who is who is going to protect herself fundamentally and, and to see what that looks like, to, to be in the mind of a criminal, but also in the mind of someone who is recognizing the criminal behavior and is not going to stand for it. Uh, this is a this is an incredible novel. Um, it's, it's psychologically horrifying. Uh, it's very realistic, very true uh, to, to the violence that is done towards women. Um, and yet it is not a book that is nihilistic in any way. Up next, a book that I think sits side by side with American Pastoral and books that I've sort of been reflecting on in my 30s. And that's Revolutionary Road by uh, Richard Yates. It's, this is the book that explodes the American dream of the 1950s and suburbia and wealth and, you know, get the home, get the family. And it burns all of that down in horrifying detail. It, it is a book that is viscerally uncomfortable to read. Uh, because so many of the ideas that Yates is is not just prodding at, but flat out like hitting with a sledgehammer, uh, exist today and exist in families. Like I have family members who I think I, I I read this novel as I've reread the novel. I think wow, that feels like when I'm at someone else's house in my family. Um, and there's something that's so true to Yates. The the writing is beautiful, and he's not afraid to allow his characters the agency to ruin their lives in a sense. Um, but this is one that, that everybody should read. <laughs> then Ragtime. Uh, this is, this is not as quite as fun as J.R. And it's not quite as silly as Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, but it, it's a fun novel. E.L. Doctorow takes us back to the Gilded Age, to, to the, to a time, uh, where, where there are, are so many incredible opportunities. This is a book in which, uh, the immigrant experience is made real. We have a middle-class family in a suburb of New York City, we have uh, a black family where the, the father plays ragtime piano and the mother is a maid for the white family. Um, and we see their relationship. And we have a, a, a Jewish family that is immigrated from Europe. And we see how all of these different families are interacting and colliding with each other. Real life characters uh, collide. Henry Ford shows up, Harry Houdini shows up. Um, the the uh, Stanford White murder trial with Harry Shaw is, is, is crucial, but uh, Doctorow is, is really just pulling back everything. And I think he's examining this idea of um, what were the opportunities and, and what allowed people to take opportunities. We see some triumphs, we see some real tragedies. Uh, we see people who claim that they're willing to do everything to help and then absolutely renege on that. We see other characters who seem to be just pathetic and, and utterly hopeless in terms of doing something right or good, and yet they step up at times. And Doctoro is willing to, to examine this idea that perhaps nobody is a hero and very few people are just unabashed villains uh, in ragtime. Not a great movie though, don't recommend it. Then, Always Coming Home by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, I think Le Guin is one of the true writers of the U.S. in the 20th century and someone who was constantly bringing this academic, this anthropologic idea. She was always questioning ideas um, around and interrogating so many ideas around gender or around religion and faith. So many, um, you know, violence and, and a national order. And in Always Coming Home, she she allows us to see a post-apocalyptic California and she, she provides sort of those anthropological details, historiographic details, uh, songs, poems that, that, that create this entire cycle 
of what the U.S. could be in the future when everything that we think of and, and hold so, so in such high esteem, this American empire that's being created, collapses and falls, as every empire does, what could be left over? What could that America be? And Le Guin postulates one. Finally, uh, from the recent past, 2015, we have The Dying Grass by William T. Fullman. Uh, the, the Seven Dreams book in which he most explicitly, I think, begins to examine just the, the horrors of uh, the, the war and the genocide committed in the 1860s, 1870s, and later uh, in the Western US. The, the explodes and subverts manifest destiny. And in part, it's because Volman is willing to uh, make Oliver Howard a, a crucial character. Howard is the namesake of Howard University, one of the great historically black colleges in the US, uh, a, a man who, who was all for educating free, you know, escaped slaves and freed slaves, and, and who was took it very seriously. He and his family took it very, very seriously and believed in it. Uh, and yet here we have him out on this mission to exterminate the Nez Perce. Um, and and she, the way that Volman examines that idea that, that there are these, these individuals, as with Dr. O, who seem to be good and yet are horrifying or seem to be horrifying and yet have moments where they stand up for what is right and, and were willing to be counted um, at, at this one moment in their lives. The detail Volman pours in, the, the way that he sourced, incredibly sourced uh, the details he provides in this volume. Uh, is, is crucial. And Volman himself has been willing to examine this idea of how do we justify violence? How do we justify cruelty? Uh, and and, and what, what does that mean about humans? Uh, and so this is, this is, would be my other, you know, final contender. So these are 25 books, 25 contenders for the great American novel. Let me know what yours are. Uh, I told uh, Brian and Greg, certainly their videos will be linked in this, uh, but I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you.